Well, tonight we're going to get back on track, and hopefully we're going to finish Genesis by the end of the year. So if you would, turn in your Bible to the book of Genesis chapter 34. Now, chapter 34 tells a very interesting story. It's about the abduction and rape of Dinah, Jacob and Leah's daughter. So if you would, turn with me to Genesis chapter 34, and let's read verses 1 and 2. It says, Now Dinah, the daughter Leah had born to Jacob, went out to visit the women of the land. When Shechem, son of Hamar, the Hivite, the ruler of that area, saw her, he took her and he raped her. Now, the reason this story is is important is because it emphasizes the sexual depravity of the Canaanites, which is which, if you've noticed, seems to be a recurring theme in the book of Genesis, especially in the stories about the patriarchs. And I want you to think about this. As we've been going through the book of Genesis, it seems like the Bible is kind of infatuated with sexuality. With Abraham, he felt that he had to lie about his relationship with Sarah, and the reason he did is because he feared that he would be killed if the men knew he was her husband. He was afraid they would kill him in order to get to Sarah. So he lied about his relationship with her. And he said that they were brother and sister. And he didn't only do that once, but he did it twice. He did that once when they were in Egypt. But he also did that when he was in the land of Canaan. Now, Isaac did the very same thing. He was afraid that he would be killed if the men knew that he was Rebekah's husband. So he lied about his relationship with her. You also have the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. So as you can see, the sexual depravity of the Canaanites and the negative impact that it had on the patriarchs and their family is a recurring theme. And it's very important that you see that because it helps you to understand why God would command the Israelites to destroy the Canaanites 400 years later. You see, when they came into the promised land, God said, I want you to totally wipe out the Canaanites. And that was literally God's judgment upon them for their sexual depravity. Let me show you an interesting passage of Scripture. And this passage of Scripture should explain why God told the Israelites to destroy the Canaanites when they came into the promised land 400 years later. Look with me, if you would, in Genesis chapter 15. Let's read verses 13 through 16. Then the Lord said to Abram, You can be sure that your descendants will be strangers in a foreign land. What was that foreign land? It was going to be Egypt, where they will be oppressed as slaves for 400 years. Remember, there was a Pharaoh who rose up that did not remember Joseph. And as a result of that, they enslaved the Israelites. At that time, they weren't known as the Israelites, but when they became a nation, they were known as the Israelites. Verse 14, but I will punish the nation that enslaves them, and in the end, they will come away with great wealth. If you remember, they spoiled the Egyptians. They literally brought out all of the wealth of Egypt. As for you, you will die in peace, and you will be buried at a ripe old age. After four generations, your descendants will return here to this land. For the sins of the Amorites do not yet warrant their destruction. Now, I want you to notice what this last verse is saying. It's saying that their sin, their sexual depravity, is why God commanded for them to be destroyed. Now, at that time, he said to Abraham that the Amorite sin had not yet warranted their destruction. But 400 years later, it would. Look at verse number 16 again. After four generations, your descendants will return here to this land. For the sins of the Amorites do not yet warrant their destruction. Notice that it says, not yet. Implying that it will warrant their destruction sometime in the future. In 400 years to be exact. So this story about Dinah's rape and abduction is very important because it emphasizes the sexual depravity of the Canaanites. And it helps to explain why God would bring judgment upon all of the Canaanites 400 years later. See, the majority of Christians have a problem with the Old Testament because when the children of Israel come come into the promised land, what does God tell them to do? He tells them to destroy all of the inhabitants. And we look at that and we think, how could a loving God do that? Well, it's because it was a time for judgment. God is very long-suffering. He had brought the patriarchs in, and they were a testimony and a witness, but he understood one thing. Because of their culture, because of their society, and because of their sexual depravity, it would only get worse and worse. Until finally, 
the land would literally vomit them out. And so this was their judgment upon them. So as we're going through these stories, I want you to understand that sometimes the things that are added, these little details, is to prepare you for what's coming 400 years later. Does that make sense? Now, let's get back to the story. Verse number one tells us that Dinah put herself in a position she shouldn't have been in. You see, in their culture at that time, unmarried women didn't go out in public unchaperoned. You either had a male escort who was a member of the family, or you had an older woman or older women who were married, and they went with you. But for a young unmarried woman to go out in public unchaperoned was a big no-no. You just didn't do it unless you were promiscuous. All of the Canaanite women did it, but you wouldn't do that if you wanted to protect yourself because that was a sign of being promiscuous. But Dinah was young, and she was immature, and she was very naive. And she just wanted to go visit her friends. And all of her brothers were out working in the fields, and all of the older married women were busy. So she took off, snuck away by herself to go visit her friends. Now look at verse number 2. When Shechem, son of Hamar, the Hivite, the ruler of that area, saw her, he took her and he raped her. Now I want you to underline the word took. Took is translated from the Hebrew word lakach. Now, the Hebrew language is kind of funny. It's got this HK sound with it. It's almost like you're trying to hark something up. If you want to say the word eat, it's lechov. If you want to talk about a street name, it's Lechov. It's so hard for me to be able to do that because we don't talk like that. But this Hebrew word is Lachach. And in this context, it means to take by force. In fact, many times this word is actually translated as to take captive. So Shechem took her captive or he took her by force and he raped her. And the reason that's put in there doesn't just say that he raped her. It says that he took her and he raped her. It's because the Bible wants it to be very clear that she was not a willing participant. Now, look at verse number 3. But then he fell in love with her and he tried to win her affection with tender words. Now, people, this is very unusual. Because normally, rape has to do with lust, not love. So when it's over, the attacker usually has no feelings towards the victim. But that wasn't the case here. Rabbinic tradition says that Dinah was very beautiful. She didn't take after her mother. She actually took after her aunt. And she took after all of the other beautiful women in the family. Remember Sarah? Remember Rebecca? Sarah was an old woman. And men still lusted after her. That's how beautiful that she was. That she was. And then you had Rebecca and, of course, Rachel. So she didn't take after her mother. She actually took after her aunts. And what's interesting about this is the rabbinic tradition says she had a very sweet spirit. So even though she wasn't a willing participant, Shechem was enamored by her after the rape. And we're going to see why in just a little bit. So what he tried to do was to win her affection with tender words. Look back at the last part of verse number 3. But then he fell in love with her. And he tried to win her affection with tender words. In other words he began to apologize for forcing himself upon her. And I'm sure that he was telling her, I love you. I didn't mean to do this. I want to marry you. And so he was trying to woo her. He was trying to gain her affection with these kind words. Now look at verse number four. So he said to his father, Hamar, get me this young girl. I want to marry her. Now, of course, in those days, marriages were arranged by the parents. So Shechem went to his father and he said, I found this woman that I want to marry. And she's not one of the community girls. This is Jacob's daughter, and I want you to go make the arrangements. Now, while this was going on, Jacob heard what had happened to Dinah. Now, probably the way that he heard is that one of the young friends that she was going to visit probably saw something take place. And then after this, when Shechem went to Hamar and she was being held captive, which we're going to see in just a little bit, she probably was able to talk through a window to one of her friends. And the friends went to tell her mother. Now, we don't know that for sure, but we do know that uh, Jacob found out about it. He happened to hear what had taken place. Look at verse number five. Soon, Jacob heard that Shechem had defiled his daughter, Dinah. Now, I want you to understand when it says soon, and what it means is almost immediately after that, Jacob heard that Shechem had defiled his daughter, Dinah. But since his sons were out in the fields herding his livestock, he said nothing until they returned. Now, I want you to underline the word defiled. 
Because the way Shechem and his father are going to see this, and the community of Shechem is going to see this, is totally different than the way Jacob and his sons are going to see this. And so we're going to see specific words used that normally wouldn't be used, but it's to emphasize the way Jacob and his sons saw what had happened. So it says that he defiled her. Now, the word defiled is translated from the Hebrew word tame, and this is a religious moral term. It literally means that he took her virginity from her so she was no longer sexually pure. Now, of course, the Canaanites didn't think anything about that because they were very sexually promiscuous and sex was even a part of their worship. They practiced something that scholars refer to as imitation magic. Some of them refer to it as sympathetic magic, very same thing. How many of you ever heard of the term imitation magic? I've talked a little bit about it. Well, the Canaanites... And it didn't matter what tribe you were from. All of the Canaanites had fertility gods. And they believed that their crops, their animals, even the land itself, everything about it, the rain, would, would be very fertile if these fertility gods had sex. So one of the ways that they tried to make the gods have sex so that their world around them would be fertile is they tried to excite them or stimulate them by having sex themselves. And that was part of their worship. So you actually had temple prostitutes and men would come to that. It didn't matter whether they were married, their, woman, their wives understood and knew that. And that was part of the religion and it was acceptable. So the men would come and they would pay money, of course, in the temple and they would have sex with the temple prostitutes. And then they also had certain rites in which virgins were brought in and, and different women were brought in. And at times, these rites included orgies. In fact, I'm going to go a little bit further, and I'm going to tell you something that most people don't know, but archaeologists have found this out because of some of the writings that they've discovered. The Babylonians had a specific fertility rite in which married women were required one day in their life, when their husband was away, to go to the temple and they were to wear a mask and they were to have sex with as many men as they could and husbands knew their wife would do that they just didn't want to know when they would do that and the Canaanites practiced the very same thing so this was a very promiscuous society so virginity meant nothing to the Canaanites but to Jacob and his sons it meant everything because virginity is what makes the marriage covenant holy. In fact, that's what the Bible teaches. And you need to understand that there was a holy lineage that God has done all the way from Adam. If we remember, it goes all the way to Noah. And then Noah has three sons. But from one of these sons, we're coming all the way down to Abraham. And God is bringing this revelation of this one true God along with his teaching. So to Jacob... Virginity is very important because virginity is what makes the marriage covenant holy. You see, when a man has intercourse with his wife for the very first time, there's a breaking of her body, the hymen, and there's a shedding of blood, and the two become one flesh. So marriage is supposed to be a blood covenant, and it's the blood covenant that makes sex holy and marriage holy. In fact, when we get to the Mosaic law, we'll begin to teach on virginity. And what we'll find is when a man marries a woman, she's actually supposed to take a handkerchief with her into the bridal chambers. And after she has sex, she uses that handkerchief to clean herself. Now, if the husband wakes up and he makes this accusation that his wife was not a virgin, he literally can immediately annul the marriage. And, and, and not only that, she'll be stoned. So the woman would clean up after herself, and of course, if her hymen's there, there's a, a breaking of her body, there's a shedding of her blood, and she wipes herself with that, and that blood on that handkerchief is referred to as the tokens of her virginity. So if a man makes that accusation, when she took that handkerchief, the very next day, because remember, their marriage ceremonies would last many times for seven days. So when she would come out, her mother would take the, the uh, token of her virginity and they would save it. So if the man made that accusation, it would be spread out among the elders. And of course, if it was, uh, his accusation was false, of course, he's going to be beaten. There's all of these penalties. But you need to understand that virginity was very, very important to Jacob and very important to his sons. Now, some scholars believe 
that this was the reason Shechem was enamored with Dinah. It's because she was a virgin. Completely and totally different than the Canaanite girls. In fact, let me tell you something very interesting. We know for a fact that the majority of Canaanite women lost their virginity at the age of 10 or 11. 10 or 11. One of the reasons is because homosexuality was very prevalent. And because of that, there were a lot of pedophiles. And there was molestations, and because of the way their culture was, they were very, very loose on sex. These kids grew up seeing it, hearing about it, knowing about it. This is what takes place. And so it was very common for the majority of the Canaanite girls to lose their virginity at the age of 10 or 11 and to be very promiscuous. And so a lot of scholars believe that that's why Shechem was so enamored with Dinah. But regardless of why he was attracted to her, Shechem had defiled Dinah, and it was a very serious matter to Jacob and to her brothers. So immediately when Jacob hears this, he sends messengers to the fields to bring the brothers in, and he says, you just tell them the bare basics. Their sister Dinah has been violated, and tell them to come home. And when they heard what had happened, of course, the brothers of Dinah were very furious. Look at verse number 7. Meanwhile, Jacob's sons had come in from the field as soon as they heard what had happened. They were shocked, and they were furious that their sister had been raped. Shechem had done a disgraceful thing against Jacob's family. This wasn't just against Dinah. This was against Jacob and his sons. It was against the entire family, something that should never be done. Now, shortly after Jacob's sons had come in from the field... Hamar came out to try and make arrangements for his son to marry Dinah. Because remember, after he had raped her, he was so attracted to her, he tried to woo her and he wanted to marry her. And he went to his father and said, make arrangements with her. And I'm sure that when his father came out, and of course we're going to find out a little bit later, Shechem comes with him, that as soon as he gets there, he can see by the look on Jacob's face and the look on her brother's face that they're furious. So notice what he said to Jacob and his sons. Look at verses 8 and 10. Hamar tried to speak with Jacob and his sons. And the reason it says tried is because they really weren't listening. Their mind was made up. That's why that word is inserted there. My son Shechem is truly in love with your daughter, he said. Please let him marry her. In fact, let's arrange other marriages too. You give us your daughters for our sons, and we will give you our daughters for your sons. And you may live among us. The land is open to you. Settle here and trade with us and feel free to buy property in this area. Now, in essence, Hamar knew that talking about the incident wasn't going to make anything better. In fact, it was only going to make things worse. So he didn't even bring up what had happened. And the reason he didn't bring anything up is for two reasons. Number one, it really wasn't that big of a deal. He can see that they're furious, and he can tell that they're upset, and they're a weird people. So it's not going to do any good to do that. But the other reason to bring it up is because he realizes they're furious, so let's not talk about it. Let's not bring up the fact that my son raped your daughter. And instead, he went straight into the marriage proposal. And he tried to point out how a marriage between Shechem and Dinah would work to Jacob and his son's advantage. Okay, I can tell just by the look on your face that you're upset and there's nothing I can say to appease you. So I'm going to come in and appeal to your love for money. Appeal to something that maybe would benefit you financially. Look at verse 10. He said, and you may live among us. Now, this is right after he says, let my daughters marry your sons and your daughters marry my sons and we'll become one. And then he says, and you may live among us. The land is open to you. Settle here and trade with us and feel free to buy property in the area. In other words, you can become a part of us and you'll be able to buy land and settle here instead of being nomads. You see, as foreigners, outsiders, they could not buy land and settle down. So what Hamar was offering to them was a chance to become a part of their community and to turn something bad into something good. It's like, I can tell that this has really upset you, but something good can come out of this. We're willing to let you to become a part of us and you can buy land and you don't have to be nomads. You won't have to buy your right to water from our wells and from our streams. You won't have to move around. You can literally settle here. Now, if you remember... 
when Sarah died, Abraham had to go in and he was able to buy a purchase of land, but it's basically only to be able to bury. Why? Because he was an outsider. So he was trying to appeal to Jacob and his sons to the, their financial situation. This could really work out for your best interest. Now, at this point in the conversation, Shechem jumps in. Look at verses 11 and 12. Then Shechem himself spoke to Dinah's father and brothers. Please be kind to me and let me marry her, he begged. I will give you whatever you ask. No matter what dowry or gift you demand, I will gladly pay it. Just give me the girl as my wife. And of course, if you know the Hebrew for dowry and gift, it's the bridal price and also a little penalty for having done something that offended the family. But he's saying, hey, I won't even pay the regular bridal price. You name the bridal price. Because remember, Shechem is a prince. His father is the ruler, not only of this city, but the, the scripture says of the entire area. So he was, in a sense, the king of this area that probably had three or four cities in it. Now, in Shechem's mind, this was a win-win situation. He would get Dinah as his wife, and Jacob and his sons would get a hefty bridal price for her, plus they could settle in and become part of them and actually buy land. Because as he told them, I'm going to pay anything that you want. So if you want to buy land, I'll pay whatever you want for the bridal price. You can use that money to buy the land. You're going to get free land in this. So in his mind, this was a win-win situation. And that's why he jumped in. It's almost as if, Dad, you're not, you're not selling it right. You're, you're, you're not convincing them. So he, in his excitement, jumped in. Because he just knew he could show them how much of a win-win situation this was. Now, here's what you don't know until you get down to verse number 17 and really down to verse number 26. And it's the fact that Dinah was actually being held against her will at Shechem's house. Jump down to verse number 17 and I'll show you how we know that and then we're going to look at verse number 26 that will clinch it. Notice what it says in verse number 17. After the brothers have told them what they want to do, they say this. But if you don't agree to be circumcised, we will take her and be on our way. Now, who does the pronoun her refer to? Dinah. So after they tell them what they want from Shechem, and basically uh, his father, after they tell them, this is what we want. We don't want a bridal price. We want you to do this if you're going to marry our sister. Then they come in and says, say, but if you won't agree to it, then we're going to take her. Now, this word take is translated from the very same Hebrew word that was used in verse number two to describe Shechem's assault on Dinah. It's the Hebrew word lakach. Shechem, if you remember, took her by force, and he raped her. That's the same Hebrew word, lakak, which is being used here. It means to take by force. So what Dinah's brothers were actually saying was, if you don't agree to be circumcised, then we will come to the city, and we will take Dinah by force. Now, we know that she was being held against her will and she was being held at Shechem's house because of verse number 26. Let's jump on down to verse number 26. We're having to get ahead of the story just for you to understand the situation because if you don't understand the situation, you won't understand why Jacob and his sons did what they did. Look at verse 26. Including Hamor and his son Shechem, they killed them with their swords, then took Dinah, same Hebrew word, lakach, and from Shechem's house and returned to their camp. So as you can see, Dinah was being held against her will at Shechem's house. So when Jacob heard the story, it wasn't from Dinah. Because Dinah was being held captive in Shechem's house. Now, people, this is very important. And the reason it is is because if you don't understand that, then you don't understand why Jacob and his sons did what they did. So... What happened was when Jacob called his sons in from the field, this is what he told them. He said, your sister's been raped. She's being held against her will in her, at her attacker's home, which is Shechem's home. 
And he and his father are coming out because they want to propose a marriage between them and negotiate it. Now, as I said, Dinah's, or not, yes, Dinah's brothers were furious that she'd been raped. And to add insult to injury, she wasn't even allowed to leave his home after he attacked her. She was being held captive in, her, in his home. And they were doing that in order to be able to coerce Jacob and his sons in agreeing to this marriage. Now, does everyone understand this situation? It's imperative that you understand the situation because if you don't understand the situation, then you don't understand why Jacob's sons did what they did. You see, in all probability, before Hamar and Shechem got there to negotiate this marriage, or at least try to, Jacob and his sons were discussing how they were going to rescue Dinah. And they realized that the deck was stacked against them. First of all, Shechem was a prince. And we're already told that his father, Hamar, was the ruler of that city. Not just that city, but he was the ruler of that entire area, which meant that if they went in and tried to take by force Dinah, everyone who was underneath him was going to come to their aid. And so they're grossly outnumbered. Secondly, Dinah was being held inside the city in Shechem's home. And the reason we're told it's inside Shechem's home is because they want us to know the situation. It's not in some place outside of the city and we can do this covertly. No, no. It's in the middle of the town. It's in the middle of the city. So if you want to get here, you're going to have to fight your way into the city and into the house that's going to be located in the very middle to be able to do that. So when they come home and they find out she's not only been raped, she's being held against her will at her attacker's home. And wouldn't you know it, the attacker is Shechem. He's the son of Hamar, the ruler of the area. Oh my gosh, what are we going to do? So I'm sure they were discussing all of their options of how they could rescue Dinah before Shechem and his father showed up. Now, the story doesn't tell us that, but it implies that when it gives us all of these details. Now, Jacob and his sons had one thing that was working to their advantage. Shechem wanted to marry Dinah. And he was willing to pay any bridal price necessary if they would agree to let her marry him. So they came up with what I think is an ingenious plan. Brilliant plan. If they could get Shechem and his father to agree to being circumcised and also agree to get all of the men of the city to be circumcised, the pain from the circumcision would incapacitate them at least for three days. And then they would be able to actually walk into the city and rescue Dinah without having to face any resistance. People, it was an ingenious plan. It was brilliant. Right? Think about this. How were we going to rescue our sister? She's being held in the prince's house in the middle of the city. His father is the king. He's the ruler of this area. We're grossly outnumbered. What are we going to do? And the reason they're keeping her there is to coerce us into giving her into marriage to Shechem. And so they said, you know what? There's no way we can fight our way in that. You know what we need to do? We need to say we'll agree to this on one condition. Shechem, you and your father have to be circumcised. But not only that, you have to get every man in the city to be circumcised. Because everyone in our family is. So when Shechem offered to pay whatever they demanded, they told him, we don't want money. We don't want a penny from you. What we want is for you and all the males of the city to be circumcised. Look at verses 13 through 17. But since Shechem had defiled their sister Dinah, Jacob's sons responded deceitfully. Horrible translation. And they all translate it that way. I want you to underline that word deceitfully. Deceitfully is actually translated from the Hebrew word mirma. Mirma refers to a clever, underhanded scheme used to achieve an objective. In other words, when you're outnumbered and there's no way by force you can do what you want or to obtain your goal, then you have to trick someone. That's what the Hebrew word mirma means. Not just deceive someone. This is a stratagem. This is a clever thing to do. 
They had discussed this. They had talked about this. They had looked at all of their options, and they realized there was no way that they could physically rescue Dinah. But you know what? We're all circumcised, and we were circumcised as children. We don't remember it. But whenever we got a servant and they came in, they were circumcised, and it's painful as an adult. Very painful. Thank God I was circumcised as a child. But anyways... And they said, if we could get them to do that, and they play right into their hands. Look at verse 13 through 17 again. Let's read it. But since Shechem had defiled their sister Dinah, Jacob's sons responded with duplicity. Mirma to Shechem and his father, Hamar. They said to them, we couldn't possibly allow this because you're not circumcised. It would be a disgrace for our sister to marry a man like you. But here is a solution. If every man among you will be circumcised like we are, then we will give you our daughters and we'll take your daughters for ourselves. We will live among you and become one people. But if you don't agree to be circumcised, we will take her and be on our way. Now, this is really interesting because most scholars miss the whole thing. They think, why were they doing this? This is a spiritual covenant between God and Abraham and between his seed. This is for the Jews only. Why in the world would they do this? This will mean nothing because they're not going to serve Yahweh. But they don't understand. They never expected them to serve Yahweh. They were only using this for one reason. To incapacitate them so they could actually walk into the city without any resistance and get Dinah without anyone getting hurt. Man, it was brilliant. Now, the bottom line was, you get all of your men to be circumcised or there's no deal. But again, as I said, it was simply a trick. It was so that they could uh, get Dinah back, but they never intended to allow Dinah to marry him. And that's what that word Mirma means. If you understand that, you understand the story. Now, Shechem is willing to do anything to get Jacob in some degree to the marriage. So as soon as they said it, he said, done! Now, I'm sure his dad was going, son, what in the world are you thinking? But, you know, all good fathers, they love their children. His son wanted to do that. He was well-respected. He was a good-looking son. You'll read the story in here. And so he says, okay. Now, they're going to have to leave a few things out to convince the people, but he's the king. So, of course, they're going to go back, and they're going to talk all the men into being circumcised. Look at verses 18 through 24. Hamar and his son Shechem agreed to their proposal. Shechem wasted no time on acting on this request. Hey, guys, this is the way you do it. Pulled out a knife. For he wanted Jacob's daughter desperately. Shechem was a highly respected member of his family. Now, his dad's already the ruler. He's next in line. He's telling him to do it. He sets the example. He's the first one. And he went with his father, Hamar, to present this proposal to the leaders at the town gate. These men are our friends, they said. Let's invite them to live here among us and trade freely. Look, the land is large enough to hold them. We can take their daughters as wives and let them marry ours. But they will consider staying here and becoming one people with us only if all of our men are circumcised just as they are. But if we do this, all of their livestock and possessions will eventually be ours. Come. Let's agree to their terms. Let them settle here among us. So all the men in the town council agreed with Hamar and Shechem, and every male in the town was circumcised. Now here's what's interesting. Hamar specifically left something out. Did you all notice that? All he did was tell them the good things. Jacob was rich. Remember that? So when he came back, There's been about 10 years that has passed since the time he's come back. So he's grown even richer. God's hand of blessing is upon them. And everyone's looked at Jacob and his sons and seen everything that he has. All of the animals, all of the servants, all of the gold and silver. And they think, you know what? If we'll let them become part of us, eventually it'll be ours. But you know the one thing they didn't tell them? We already agreed to let them buy land. They left that out. Because they didn't want to put anything negative here. So all they heard was the positive, and it was the king 
the ruler of the land and his well-respected son who is the prince who's going to be the future ruler of the land. They've already set the example. They've already told him the good thing so all the men agreed to do it. Now, Jacob's plan and his son's plan was that on the third day when the pain from circumcision is the most excruciating and the reason it's the most excruciating on the third day is because it's starting to scab. Now, I worked with a person at Southwestern Bell, and because of some infections, his doctor said you need to be circumcised, and he was 42 years old. He was off for 14 days. When he came back, he said, Alan, I would never do that again. It's the most painful thing in the world. And on the third day, I'm telling you, you think you're going to die. You can do nothing but lay on the bed with your legs spread. Now, I'm not trying to be crass and gross, but you need to understand the plan. On the third day, their plan was, we are going to enter the city together, all of Jacob's sons, and rescue Dinah. And hopefully no one's going to get hurt because they're going to be incapacitated. They're going to be hurting too bad to do anything about it, so there's not going to be any resistance. But here's the problem. Simeon and Levi didn't just want to rescue Dinah. Oh, no. They wanted revenge. They wanted to kill Shechem for raping Dinah. They wanted to kill Hamar for trying to sweep it under the carpet and act like it was nothing. And even that didn't satisfy them. They wanted to kill every man in the city because they had allowed this culture to perpetuate and to defile their sister. And in their mind, every one of the men in the city deserved to die. Now, does everyone know why Simeon and Levi were angrier than all the other brothers? Anyone know? Verse number one. Now Dinah, who was born to who? Leah. Leah. And who were Simeon and Levi born to? Leah. Not Rachel. Not Bilhah or the other concubine. So I want you to understand something. Dinah was not Simeon and Levi's half-sister, but with all the other older brothers, she was just a half-sister. No, but not for them. They had the same mother and the same father, so she was a full-blood sister. And that's why all the details are important. In verse number one, the reason they mention Leah is not because Leah is important to the story. It's because Simeon and Levi are important to the story, and they are full brothers and sister and so all the other brothers go well that's our half sister you know we share the same dad but different mothers and we're not as close Simeon and Levi said you're not going to do that to our sister and get by with it and that's why that detail is mentioned in verse number one so instead of going with their brothers at the prescribed time to rescue Dinah they went an hour early now we think it's an hour or two hours because by the time they kill all the men now is when the brothers come but they actually went early and they killed every man in the city. And people, it was like taking candy from babies. Because the men couldn't defend themselves. They were so sore on the third day. So literally, Levi and Simeon run in and they go, You're a Shechemite. <clears throat> and they just go from house to house. And they kill every male and possibly above the age of nine years old. We don't know how young... But when it talks about them taking the women and children with them, the word for children in Hebrew refers to toddlers. So it could even be as young as six years old. Every male is killed by Simon and Levi. And the reason they were able to kill them is because they were completely incapacitated by the pain from the circumcision. Look at verses 25 through 27. But three days later, when their wounds were still sore, two of Jacob's sons, Simon and Levi, who were Dinah's full brothers, took their swords and entered the town without opposition. <laughs> Who's going to stop them? Then they slaughtered every male there, including Hamar and his son Shechem. They killed them with their swords, then took Dinah from Shechem's house. She'd been held captive there and returned to their camp. Meanwhile, the rest of Jacob's sons arrived. They're right on time. This is part of the plan. And finding the men slaughtered, they plundered the town because their sister had been defiled there. So when the other brothers arrived, according to plan, every man in the city was dead. So they plundered the city. Look at verses 28 and 29. They seized all the flocks and herds and donkeys, everything they could lay their hands on, both inside the town and outside in the fields. They looted all their wealth and plundered their houses. They also took their little children. That's important. 
What age do they begin to kill all the males? Don't quite know, but we know that it's before they hit the teen years. And wives, and they led them away as captives. So they took all of the women and children and all of their wealth. Now, when all, of they, when all of the sons come back and Simeon and Levi's there and they're telling the story and Jacob finds out what Simeon and Levi did, man, he hits the roof. Man, he's upset because no one was supposed to have died. That was not part of the plan. The objective was what? To rescue Dinah and to leave. Look at verses 30 and 31. Afterward... Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have ruined me. You've made me stink among all the people of this land. you made us odorous. No one will help us now. Among all the Canaanites and Perizzites, we are so few that they will join forces and crush us. I will be ruined and my entire household will be wiped out. But why should we let him treat our sister like a prostitute, they retorted angrily. In other words, Simeon and Levi, they're still filled with so much rage, just like, let them come. We're not going to allow anyone to treat our sister like a whore, like a prostitute. They did that. They deserved it. Let the others come. And we're going to find out that God's going to put the supernatural fear upon all the others so that it doesn't happen. But let me ask you a question. Why wasn't Jacob upset with the other brothers? I mean, the plan was not to plunder the homes. It wasn't to take the women and the children, the small children. It wasn't to go in and take all their gold and all their wealth. Why wasn't he upset with them? Well, I'll tell you why. It's because they did the only thing they could have done once they found out that all of the other men men in the city were dead. You see, in that time period, you couldn't have left the women and children behind without men to not only support them or to defend them. So basically, out of charity and kindness, they take everything. So, well, you're going to come live with us. And they take them. And some of you are probably wondering as we go through the story, well, if they weren't supposed to marry the Canaanites, who did the sons of Jacob marry? You're supposed to infer it from the story. The young toddler women, girls, will grow up in a monotheistic home out of that situation of that, and they're going to become the wives. Now, not all of them. We're going to find out what Judah does and some of the other ones. But that answers the question, too. They took the women and the children and they plundered the city. Now, here's what I want you to do, and we're going to end with this. Pull out your discipleship card. Every time you read your Bible or you hear a sermon, you need to ask yourself this question. And the passage of Scripture I just read or the sermon I just heard, is there a command I should obey? an example I should follow, or a principle I should live by. Now, most of you have read these Old Testament stories, and you look at them and go, that was really interesting, Pastor Allen. But what are you going to do with it? There's a reason it's in there, not only for you to understand how we're getting to this chosen people from whom the seed of the woman is going to come, and then all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed because of Jesus, the seed of the woman. But there's also lessons in these stories. So... What are we supposed to learn from this? Is there a command we should obey? Is there an example we should follow? Are there principles we should live by? Well, in this story, there are three principles we should live by. And I'm going to give them to you. Principle number one, never put yourself in a position you shouldn't be in. Most of the time, the trouble that we get into is not God's fault. It's our fault. It's not even the devil's fault. It's our fault. We've put ourselves in a position that we shouldn't be in. Be in, People, this whole thing happened because Dinah put herself in a position she shouldn't have been in. She should have never gone into that environment unchaperoned. She knew better. Jacob and her brother said, you don't go in public by yourself. You want to go visit your friends? Then you have one of your brothers go with you, or you go with your mother, or some of the other married women, but you don't go by yourself. But you know how it is. She's young, she's immature, she's naive. She wants to be around other girls her own age. All the other Canaanite girls are doing all this. So when everyone's busy, she sneaks away to go visit her friends. And she puts herself in a position she should have never been in. Now listen to me. This is, we're, we're applying this to children. We're applying this to young people. This is a wonderful story to teach to young people when we talk about our culture and places we should go or not go, things we should do or not do. But I'm going to tell you, this applies to adults too. 
the majority of trouble or problems that we get into as adults is because we put ourselves in a position we shouldn't be in. Affairs happen because we put ourselves in positions we shouldn't be in. Embezzlement takes place because we put ourselves in a position we shouldn't be in. Amen? Principle number one. Don't ever put yourself in a position you shouldn't be in. You protect yourself with boundaries, guardrails. Principle number two. Parents, be more diligent watching over your kids. Dinah knew better than to go visit her friends unchaperoned, but she was young, immature, and naive, naive, so she snuck out. But her parents, Jacob and Leah, should have been watching over her better. Now, to be honest with you, I should have watched over my kids better than I did. Now, at the time, I thought I was doing a great job, but people, we live in a very ungodly society. Your kids can sneak around and do things without you. They know computers better than you do. You don't know what sites they are. They know how to hide all that. And unless you're a computer whiz, boy, they passed you a long time ago. They know what your phone can do, and you have no clue. You don't use your phone to half its capacity, but your kids know every little function it can do. But I'm telling you, we live in an ungodly society, and children are naive. They do not realize the consequences of their actions. So they'll sneak around, and they'll get themselves into, into trouble. And that was Dinah. She had no idea Yes, her parents were telling, this is an ungodly uh, society. It's an ungodly culture. Dinah, you don't understand. There's problems out there. You're naive. Mom and dad were idiots till she got out there. And she was raped and held against her will. And a whole city of males are wiped out because of that. Principle number three. Even though Jacob's sons did something terrible, God still used them. And God still worked through them to fulfill his plans. Now, this is fantastic, and I'll tell you why. If you've done something that you think is so terrible, so horrible, and you don't think that God could ever use you because of that or work through you to accomplish his plan, that the plan he had for you will never come to fruition, I want you to understand something. God puts these stories in there to let you know that he still used Jacob's sons. He still worked his plan through them. Man, they did a horrible thing. They killed every man... And and the implication is what we infer is everyone from probably about six years old and up, they killed seven, eight, nine-year-old men. But God still was able to use them because they were willing. So it doesn't matter what you've done. If you truly repent, God can use you. 